the thing we're talking about today is about generosity. And I don't know for some people, talking about money is one of the things that they think, well, man, the church is just after my money. Well, the church, uh, even in, so um, my, someone I know uh, didn't go to church for like 40 years because at one stage they had uh, pledged some money to a church and then their husband became sick and so they couldn't be at church for, for a little while. And then that church, representatives from the church came to them and said, oh, just by the way, notice you haven't been around for a while. The money you owe us is this much money. <clears throat> and that person went, man, these, these people even love me. What is this? I thought this was supposed to be a family. Uh, I, thought this, I thought we were people who loved Jesus, uh, who loved one another. And I'm actually in a place of need right now and didn't go to church for the next 40 years of their life. And so uh, we don't want to be flippant about money, but we can't not talk about money. Money features in the scriptures a lot. Not just because it's in the scriptures a lot, although that's reason enough for us to talk about money, or generosity more generally, I should say, Uh, but also because money features so heavily in our lives, so heavily in our hearts, so heavily in our minds. Either the lack of money can dominate your mind, or having a lot of money can dominate your mind, or the attempt to gain a lot of money can dominate your mind and your attention and your life. <clears throat> and so because we are about disciples making disciples, we need to talk about money. We need to talk about generosity in particular. One of the things I find amazing in talking about money or generosity is when we tend to read the Bible and we see the scriptures talk about the rich as a class or as a category, we Australians tend to read that and think of squillionaires in giant mansions, rolling around in very expensive cars, with very expensive clothes, dripping in expensive jewellery. Uh, we tend to think about, you know, we think about all the one percenters. They're the rich, the, the, the top one percent are the rich. But then you zoom out on our lives and you go, okay, well, let's talk about the average wage in Australia, and even the average wage in Australia, to some here might, might be a lot of money. To some here, the average wage in Australia might seem like, man, how do people even live on that? Uh, but for the person who is on the exact median wage in Australia, it's in the top 1.6% of rich people in the world. Average in Australia is almost top 1% in the world. That's just today. <clears throat> if you zoom out over time as well, so you consider people who have, all people who have ever lived, and you consider the, again, the average Australian, single income household, the average single income household in Australia, more wealthy than 1.6, sorry, less wealthy than 1.6% of people who currently live, uh, and in the kind of microscopic percentile of people who have ever lived. Uh, okay, say, say, the, say the average seems too high for you. What about single income household on $25,000 a year? In terms of income, puts you in the top 12.5% richest people on earth. So again, when we think about, when we read scriptures, and we're going to read something in a minute that talks about rich people, <clears throat> For us in Australia, we tend to only look up. We don't, and I don't mean to, to, to God. We look at those people who are more wealthy than us, who have more than us, or seemingly have more than us. That's how we like to think of ourselves as, as whether or not we are rich. But again, when we zoom out, and this is uncomfortable to hear, but when the Bible talks about rich people, they're talking about you. Paul's time of writing. And I understand the cost of living is high. I understand money is a struggle for people. When I, I'm not saying you're rich flippantly. Please don't hear me say that. I'm not saying you don't have money troubles at all. Chances are very good. Again, just looking at the statistics that the average Australian is spending more than their income. Very small savings, let alone investing. Speaking to someone during the week uh, who... Own, they own their house outright, but talking about, man, what about my kids? 
How will they ever possibly, in this climate, uh, let alone in the future, how, how are we supposed to live, survive, grow, earn, etc.? cetera? Uh, again, $25,000 per year is five times the median global income, average income. So 25, a single household, $25,000 a year, earning, 20, earning five times the average person in the world. We need to radically reorient our relationship to money if we're going to read the scriptures and hear them actually speak to us. You might say, what about, you know, I'm a POV uni student or just on like Youth Allowance or Centrelink or et cetera. Uh, you are still richer than six billion people alive today. In Australia, I mentioned this recently, uh, we played this game at my discipleship group where we're kind of you know, saying, um, how are we going on a scale of one to 10? Uh, 10 being unbelievable, best ever. Uh, one being life is horrible. You can't pick eight because that's just a safe option. Uh, and for me, in, in my mind, I'm thinking zoomed out, uh, even if my life is, is like tragically poor, being in Australia, being healthy, having a church family that loves me, uh, would I consider the things that, that I have? Again, how are we gonna, how are we gonna get perspective on what the scriptures is, telling to, is saying to us about wealth and about generosity? when we can't accurately even understand how wealthy we are as a baseline in Australia. I'm talking like the, the baseline of wealth, where if we get sick, we can go to a hospital and get treated. We, don't, we might take for granted how unbelievable that is, not just on a global scale, but on a historic, historical scale. The Bible talks about rich people. It is very likely it's talking to us. Now, obviously, there'll, you know, there'll be outliers, and if you're watching online, maybe you are one of those outliers, possibly in the room. You're an outlier. Met someone last week who, <laughs> like, escaped a war zone with the clothes on his back, uh, with nothing, no family, no friends, no connections, no skills because he's grown up in war. Uh, just deficit. And so when I think about, maybe someone like that can say, okay, maybe the Bible's not talking about me necessarily. Uh, but for, the, for most of us, I just again want to reorient our understanding or our perspective at least before we even open the scriptures to understand that it is likely, even though you don't think of yourself as rich, you might think of yourself as struggling or broke, <clears throat> Um, you might, again, be looking at other people who have more than you and very rarely looking at people who have less than you and considering the scale of people, the mountain of people who have less than you. I, I'm, I'm not saying this to make us feel guilty. I'm just trying to get us to have a correct perspective on our own rich, riches. And I know even within that, there's a big spectrum of richness in this room, um, before we get to scripture, we get to understand it's talking to us. If we understand that we are rich on a global scale and on a historic scale, then we need to go to some of those passages in scripture that where it talks about riches. If we actually understand that we are rich or wealthy, we need to understand Jesus does not shy back from talking about finances. The scriptures don't shy about talking about finances at all. Jesus said, what you do, this is recorded in Matthew 6, what you do with your money exposes what is first or preeminent in your heart. We do with our money, and not just the money that we have, but how we pursue money, how we make decisions about money, shows who or what is first in our heart. Matthew 6. He goes on to say a couple of verses later, nobody can serve two masters. 
You can't serve both God and money. You'll either hate one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. You can't serve God and money. Uh, and another, opportunity, another time, uh, this guy comes to Jesus. And everybody seemed, seemed like they knew who this guy was. Pretty wealthy guy. Uh, pretty, pretty holy by all accounts. And he says to, comes and says to Jesus, um, what do I have to do? And Jesus says, follow the commandments, here's what we have to do. And the guy says, I've done all those things. And Jesus looks at him and loves him. It's like, this guy, he's a good guy. And he says, here's the thing you lack. Sell everything. Come follow me. <clears throat> and the guy goes away sad because he was very wealthy. And the disciples say, how? How are we supposed to do this? And Jesus says, man, how difficult it is for the rich, that's us, to enter the kingdom of heaven. And the disciples say, it's impossible. We can't do it. Can't do it. How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God, Jesus says. And then a little later, through a quarter, Jesus, right, Jesus uh, says, take care, be on your guard against all covetousness for, life's, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. So again, it's Jesus giving us a warning of only looking up and comparing our lives to somebody else's life on a scale of material wealth and envying what somebody else has. He says, that's the wrong scale. First, you don't compare. Secondly, don't, that's the wrong scale, even if you are going to compare. Martin Luther, he said, there are three conversions necessary. Conversion of the heart, conversion of the mind, conversion of the wallet. Uh, Spurgeon, he said, with some Christians, the last part of their nature that ever gets sanctified is their pockets. And so again, we, man, because money is such a big part of our lives, uh, you're either, <clears throat> either working for it, have worked for it, uh, are concerned about it, think about spending it, think about making it, worried about not having enough. We need to see how then should we be approaching money. So let me read from uh, 1 Timothy, then we'll pray. We'll get stuck into it. This is what Paul writes to Timothy. So this is a, an older Christian, an apostle, who has this young guy in his life who, he's like a father to this, this guy. I was going to call him a kid. He's probably not a kid, but young, young man. He's like a father to him, trying to disciple him, training him up in the ways of Jesus. And he says this, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty or arrogant, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous, ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Okay, so let's pray and we'll see what we're going to have for us today. Let's pray. And so Father, and as always, we need your help in reading and understanding your word, your scriptures. So help us, please, Lord, speak to our hearts and our minds. In fact, we're confident you're doing this already. Speak, speak to our hearts and our minds and to our wallets today, we're asking. We do want to become more like Jesus. We want to go away changed more into his likeness. We don't want to be subject to money, but subject to you, the loving God of the universe who loves us. And so help us. In Jesus' name, amen. So he, here's the goal. This is, this is where Paul finishes this thought about money to Timothy. He says, the reason he wants to tell people about money, and in fact, he wants to tell Timothy to tell the rich people about how to handle their money so that they can take hold of that which is truly life. So he's already trying to draw this contrast between the thing for which we spend a lot of time and energy and effort, and in a sense, rightly so, because money is a tool, and, and we do need money. But he draws this line in between the pursuit of money for its own sake and 
the pursuit of money in a way that doesn't entangle our hearts to money. And he says, don't entangle your heart to money so that you can take hold of that which is truly life. So money is not life. And for us, we go, we're like, yeah, of course we know this. Of course we know this. But then we go and spend most of our time and our effort and our energy in pursuit of it or worrying about it. So let's, let's backtrack to the beginning of this. Paul warns against arrogance or conceit. Remember, he's talking to rich people. He's talking to the average Australian. So if you're not average, if you're above average, uh, he's perhaps in particular talking to us. But I think for almost every Australian, on again a global and historic scale, he's talking to us. And he warns us against arrogance or conceit. But that he's saying that we have arrived somewhere because of the money that we have. Or the position that we have that gets us the money that we have, or the kind of car that we drive, or the kind of house we live in. He's saying, don't hang your hat. I've got something flying around me here. Don't hang your hat or anchor your hope or build your identity on money or the things that money can give. Don't do that. And also, the, the inverse of that is, uh, don't think that you haven't arrived because you don't have money. Don't think that you're lesser than because you haven't attained riches. The two sides of the same coin. The two uh, unhelpful ways of relating with money. Thinking that money's going to get us the thing that we need. Or money has made us, or we've arrived because we have money, or that we haven't arrived because we don't have money. Trusting in riches, uh, Paul is saying, is a thing that will prevent you from holding on to that which is truly life. A culture operates like this. So a culture will look at someone who has and go, they've made it. They're obviously, they've done something right. Um, you know, life has smiled on them or they've worked really hard or uh, they've been very lucky or uh, they've made it. And James, Jesus' brother, warns the Christians against treating people like this. He says, do not look at the wealthy person and say, yeah, come and sit next to me. Come and have the position of, of honour in our gatherings because, because you have money. And so don't look at the person who demonstrably doesn't have money and say, well, you, we're going to forget about you or you could be over there. Say, so don't treat people according to money. We don't do this. Our culture operates like this, but we don't operate like this. And Paul warns us to not hold our hope on our riches because they're uncertain. He says, instead, set your hope on God. So, man, it, our, our whole culture is built up on this thing where if you have, or if you can display that you have, or go into debt, you know, behind the scenes, so that in front of the scenes it looks like you have, so that people will treat you well or treat you better or so you can feel better about yourself. He says, this is building your life on a, an unstable foundation. So you have the foundation of Christ right here. Don't look over here and build your, foundation, build your life on this foundation. You already have the unshakable foundation in Christ here. Set your hope here. Interestingly, Paul doesn't say to Timothy, tell the rich to give away all their money. Tell the rich to be frivolous with their money because money doesn't matter. Tell the rich to become poor because poor is preferable. That's not what Paul says. He says, if you're rich, don't make your identity in being rich. Inverse can be true as well. If you're poor, don't build your identity in being poor. Don't hang your hope on being poor. Don't say, well, at least I'm not like those rich people in my poverty. It's not about rich or poor. It says to the Philippian church, he writes, he says, man, I've... He says, thank you for your partnership in the gospel. Thank you for your generosity with your lives and with your money. He says, I've learned, what it's, I've learned to be content in every situation, he says. In poverty and in riches, I can be content. I can be satisfied. In weakness and in strength, I can be, I can be satisfied. Sickness and health, I can be satisfied. He says, I can do everything through Christ who strengthens me because he's not building his life on a shaky foundation. He's built it on the unshakable foundation of Christ. 
So Paul's not saying, I prefer poverty or I prefer riches. He's certainly not presenting any kind of prosperity gospel that says, God wants you to be wealthy. God wants you to have more money. God wants you to be healthy all the time. He's saying, in every circumstance, I have learnt how to be content and satisfied because my life is built on the rock. He kind of echoes King David. Uh, David says, uh, Psalm 62, if riches increase, don't set your heart on them. So it's not saying don't work hard. It's not saying don't accrue money. It's not saying don't steward wealth really well. He's saying if you get more money, if you get more stuff, if you drive a nicer car, if you live in a nicer house, don't set your heart on those things. It's, it is, no, I was going to say it's, it could be easier, but I don't think so. I know people who are very wealthy and use their money incredibly well and don't have the heart set in the money. I know people who are on the less well-off end of the spectrum in Australia whose hearts are still set on money, still wrapped up in money, not because they don't have enough, but because they desire more. They're trying to build their life on the shaky foundation of money. It's not about how much money you have. It's about is your heart entangled to your money. Paul writes here, what matters isn't the size of your portfolio, your bank account, large or small, but on the wealth of your good works, on your generosity and your preparedness to share what God has given you. So this is the reward of this kind of life, of living a life built on the foundation of Christ, is actually sharing in Jesus' inheritance. So we build our life on Jesus and not on money and on our wealth, then we, are, we share in His inheritance, which is the universe. And so again, he's drawing this comparison, saying, when you're pouring all your effort and energy and you're, you're hanging your life on how much you have amassed, and you can walk confidently in any room because of your bank account or what you've accomplished. He says, how can you do that when your inheritance is everything? That's nonsensical. If we have this perspective, just like we need, to, we need to reorient our perspective on how rich we really are living in 2024 in Australia. We are, we are rich. Likewise, we need to reorient our understanding of where riches really lie. Not in amassing wealth where you know, moth and rust destroy, but those riches in heaven where moth and rust don't destroy. They last for forever. And we are co-heirs with Jesus in his inheritance. It's, it's a radical perspective shift what it, means to be, what it means to be rich, which also means it's a radical perspective shift what it means to be generous, which is where Paul's thinking goes then. We've spoken about this over the last month. Uh, Paul says, do good, be rich in good works. So tell those who are, who are wealthy, tell those who are rich, that's us. Don't be, don't amass riches. That's not the goal. The goal is to be rich in good works. And again, we've spoken about what it looks like to open up our lives, open up our homes, to share what we have, in fact, to share our very lives, to weave the fabric of our lives into the fabric of those around us. That is the kind of radical gospel generosity that Paul's talking about. It's a life, not just with margin for other people, but a life where we intentionally dedicate in our week time and dedicate in our budget money to serve our family, serve our neighbours, serve our work colleagues, serve our church family. This is what it looks like because we are not trying to amass our money. We're not trying to cling to our cash. Wherever we are on that spectrum of wealth, even from an Australian perspective, which again is right up here, like in the top couple of percentile, likely, especially for us living in suburban Adelaide, we're probably, even from an average Australian perspective, further down that end. 
but even there's a, there's a spectrum even among us here. He's not saying uh, try to be more poor or try to be more rich. He's saying regardless of where you are on that scale, be rich in this scale, generosity with your life and with your money. What we haven't spoken about so much over the last couple of weeks is uh, the need for your generosity in how we organize as a church community. We have, in particular, when it comes to discipleship, we have this great need. Uh, in our kids' ministry, we have a gargantuan need. Like over 100 people under 18 who need discipleship, who need love and attention and care, who need people to say, I am going to not just give of my margin, not just wait till I see what I have at the end of the week, and then if I have any, any time left over or energy left over, oh, I'll give that but that we will carve out of our time an intentional block that we give to, some of you will give to our young people. We have a growing youth cohort here at City Light as well, um, and they need love and attention and discipleship, energy and effort, and especially time. And again, we can't just give people leftovers. That's not generosity. Generosity is not leftovers. Leftovers literally is what I give to my dog, right? That's leftovers. That gives him really nice mints. I give him leftovers. <laughs> but when it comes to our young people, <clears throat> man, they need our generosity. They need our time and our effort. And that you might then be, you might then be taking time away from time you could have spent into amassing more money. Which means you might need to have uh, a, re, like a reconsideration of your family budget or the kinds of holidays or kind of lifestyle that you live so that you can carve out the time necessary to disciple and pour into those youth. But also, we've got, again, we've got people in the church who are very new to the faith or who are growing in the faith or who are in times of their lives where uh, like I'm thinking especially with like young families who have less spare time than perhaps they'll have in the rest of their life. And they need us to speak into their lives. Time, money, energy, effort. This is the scale in which Paul says, be rich in generosity. Be rich in good works. Be the one percenters in giving of your life. This is what he's saying. We have need in our coffee team, our setup team, uh, like on our governance board who relate to the government. Uh, We've got need in our music team. When the family comes together like this in our family gatherings, uh, we we are coming to serve one another and to serve the Lord. Again, we don't don't come as consumers looking to uh, consume or receive religious goods and services and then maybe pay some money in, in, in some kind of transactional sense. That's not what's going on here. There is no church abstract of our church family. We are the church who gather together. And Paul, and I'm echoing him, echo Jesus, who's echoing David, who he inspired. That we want to be rich on that scale of generosity. There are heaps of opportunities for you to participate in the life of the church here. What about, what about financial riches? We've already received in Christ. What we have received in Christ not only liberates us from excessive concern over our wealth, but motivates us to spend our money in a way that will bring God glory. So just like we need to carve out time in our like weekly budget, our time budget, we need to carve out money from our budget For some, this will be easy because you have excess. Again, I'm not talking about the leftovers. If you have a greater degree of ability, you have a greater degree of ability to be generous. I am not talking about like tithing to the church. I'm just going to assume that that's already a part of your, uh, if you're in Christ, you're already already like generously giving to the, the local mission here. I'm talking about how do we be generous in thinking about the people who are around us? How do we think about being generous with the people who are in our lives? People who are in our church communities? How can we be 
relaxing on our figurative mountain of financial riches while our brother or sister is in dire need or lack. We can't. And again, when we zoom out and look at the global scale, I think about the 150-ish uh, Compassion children that we sponsor as a church community. Um, some of us have, vis- have visited some of them and seen their lives. And we're thinking about, man, if you're ever, if you're ever wondering or you think, oh yeah, Don, you say that I'm rich because I live in Australia in 2024, but uh, I don't feel rich. Uh, if you come with us on one of those trips that we hope to start having again next year and meet our Compassion sponsor kids, you will never think of yourself as not rich again. But we must think of our wealth as worship. And so how are we worshiping God with our wealth? Some will have very little capacity to give in terms of financially for various reasons. Injury or time of life or I mean, life hasn't gone well or being fired from your job or... There, there are heaps of like, times of life or, or perhaps even some people who will never have the kind of dollar-denominated capacity for generosity, but for, for whatever, however big our pie is, we want to be thinking how we're going to use the whole of our pie to worship Jesus. Jesus, Jesus honours the widow who comes and puts in two mites because her life is not built on trying to establish her earthly kingdom of of wealth. She's not trying to establish herself financially. She has established herself on God. And in faith says, I worship God and not money, with her too. The deal is, if, we, if you are a co-heir with Christ, again, we're zooming out, reorienting our perspective on how rich we are, but then also considering our true riches in Jesus and then comparing those incomparable riches to what we were once trying to store up for ourselves. Man, we, when we have this perspective, we can't look over here for satisfaction can't look over here for comfort anymore, can't look over here for our identity, can't look over here for security or meaning anymore because our perspective is that this is so much greater, so much more, not just worthwhile, but actually, truly satisfying. Again, when Paul says, I've learnt, I can be satisfied in poverty. For us in Australia in 2024, in the culture, That's unthinkable. How can you be satisfied in poverty? It doesn't make sense. And Paul says, but I already have immeasurable riches in Christ. He's trying to help Timothy, help the rich people, uh, and also help us to understand we can have freedom from our bondage or our entanglement to money. He doesn't say be a bad steward. He doesn't say be frivolous with money. He doesn't say don't think about money. He says don't worship money. Money doesn't decide, can I do this or not do that? Or God's asking me to be generous in this way with my neighbor or with somebody. I can't do it because I want something else. Or it might mean you don't take a promotion that would give you more money because you have a better opportunity to serve God where you are. Or it means, might mean that you do go somewhere because you have a better opportunity to serve God when you prefer to stay where you are and be comfortable. Is this making, making sense? The goal is not to separate you from your money. The goal is to separate you from your love of money so that money actually becomes a tool and not something you are tethered to. So again, I'm not saying be poor and, and preferencing being poor. And if you don't have a lot, I'm not saying preference being rich and having more money. 
I'm saying let's separate ourselves, let's disentangle ourselves from the love of money so we, we can actually have a good relationship with money and start to steward it well. That's what I'm trying to say. So that we can take hold of that which is truly life. That's Paul's goal here. Money makes a really bad God. But for many, maybe even for most uh, in Australia, money, in a sense, is a God. It's a thing that we spend our time, our effort, our emotional and our mental energy getting, worrying about, concerning ourselves with, trying to get more of, judging people by their financial status, or at least by the things that might denote their financial status, like again, clothing or cars or house or job, those kinds of things. But money makes a really, really bad God. Money's actually a crushing God. It will crush you. And so the scriptures are trying to say, again, stop having God as most pre- uh, it stops having money as your God. Money is most preeminent in your life and you're thinking, build your life on Jesus. Paul says elsewhere, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one of us must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things, at all times, you may abound in every good work. So here we, we hear another so that. So, so that you may take hold of what's really life and so that you may abound in every good work. So again, if we can, if we can extricate our, our lives from the love of money, if we can kind of kill the love of money, build our life on Jesus, we can actually use money in a very helpful kind of way. We may abound in every good work. We may take hold of that which is truly life. To see to it that we don't set our hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. We are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for ourselves as a good foundation for the future so that we may take hold of that which is truly life. So here's some questions I want us to think about this week and in particular in our discipleship groups. How can we get rid of our idolatrous pursuit and fleshly use of money? And how can we join Jesus in his generosity? Let's ask questions like this. And again, this is not to heap any kind of shame. This is just to reorient our thinking and our lives away from the love of money. If everyone gave of their lives, like their time, like we give, like I, like I give, if you think to yourself this week. If everybody in a church community served like I serve, would this be a wonderful community or would this be a community at all? If everybody discipled people like I disciple people, would this be a community of disciple-making disciples or would this be no community at all? If everyone treated money like I treat money, if everyone was generous like I'm generous, again, to the degree that you can be generous, would we be a community marked by generosity or would we, a, would we be a stingy and greedy community? Would, our, would my family or my neighbours or my community think that Christians are generous or would my neighbours, community, family think that Christians are super stingy? And because you might not have known you were rich before today, but now you know you're rich. Here are some things that we can do. Practically speaking, if you're serious about stewarding this resource that God has given us for worship. I'm not saying, please, please don't hear me say, you know, so you must be uh, very frugal and, you know, not go on holidays or not have nice things. I'm not saying that at all. Saying, don't love money. Don't love it. So here's some practical things. Uh, 
track where your money goes. Track where your time goes. How am I spending my time? Do an inventory on your time. If you think that I'm time, if you think I'm time poor, inventory your time. See how you are spending your time. If you think that you are financially poor, track your money. See where it's going. Find out if you are actually poor. Pray about how God would have you spend the money he's entrusted to you. However much money that is. On Australian scale, small or average or large, whatever that is, uh, actually go to God and ask him. Not just, not just for like wise counsel, like, oh God, what do you think? Uh, Google, what do you think? Friend, what do you think? What do I think? Let's come up with a good idea. But actually go to him first and go, God, how would you have me live? How, who would you have me serve? Even just consider who are the people in your lives right now? Who are the people who have less than you or who are in need right now? Uh, consider the why behind you, every purchase. If how you spend your time is worship, if how you spend your money is worship, consider how am I spending my time? Is this worship? Am I, am I worshiping well? Am I spending my money? Who am I worshiping as I spend this money? Um, and once you have the why, critique, am I making a God-honoring, God-glorifying or purchase or a flesh-gratifying purchase? Pray about how God would have you be generous with the money he's entrusted to you. Again, not just whatever's left over because there will never be something left over because the average person spends more than they earn. And so I'm not trying to give you financial advice at all, uh, although I think it's really good to go and get financial advice. What I'm trying to say is pray about how can I be more strategic with what I have? Whatever, however big your pie is, to say how can I be generous with this pie? And then <clears throat> I want to ask you to think about how could you commit to like testing, testing it out in your life. Think, okay, I'm going to have one less coffee a week uh, less whatever it is a week, again, to the degree that you are able, and I'm going to practice generosity. I'm going to look for who is God bringing into my life uh, a compassion-sponsored child, a, a missionary uh, overseas somewhere or locally uh, who has said, well, I'm actually carving out all of my time uh, to not go and earn money, but rather to, do, to be about God's work and, and making disciples. Uh, Etc. Or hospitality. How can I be more generous with my home and with my life and with preparing food, etc. So you can be a Christian and rich. You can be a Christian and poor. I know people who are at both ends, like right at the ends of, the, of that spectrum. God doesn't want to separate you from your money, but he desperately wants to separate you from your love of money. He will kill you. We need to steward our time and our riches well. Uh, please, in your discipleship groups this week, let's op open up about how we're going to intentionally, purposefully, strategically start to do this in our lives. Again, it's not about how much money you have. It's about ensuring money doesn't have you. You can't serve God on money. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you for your goodness and your kindness to us. Uh, and... <laughs> This is a difficult uh, subject for us, not because it's tricky or because you haven't been clear in your scriptures, Father, but because our, our hearts are so easily entangled. And all of our culture is saying to us and advertising is saying to us that we deserve it and we should have more and try to get more or that our value is wrapped up in our wealth or riches or, or status symbols. But Father, help us, please to anchor our hope in Jesus, to have the perspective on, I mean, firstly, how rich we already are materially, but even more so, how rich we truly are in Jesus. And Father, let that be the, the key lens through which we view the world. Help us, please, Father, to be a community marked by generosity, not just the few carrying the load for the many, but that each of us to the degree that we're able, will carry 
that load of generosity, that we'll be rich in good works, always looking for and, and seeing and recognising when we, when we see it, uh, those opportunities to serve and to give of our time and our energy and our effort, to disciple others, to love others, to, to be with others, and with our finances likewise. So we look for opportunities in our family, and our neighbourhood, across the globe, uh, with missions and, and uh, partners like Compassion that we'd be able to um, sow generously and reap generously. Lord, help us, uh, for those of us who have become entangled with the love of money. Father, I'm asking you to help us to cut off that love. We'd be able to use money well uh, and not desire it. Father, help us teach our hearts satisfaction in Jesus. Contentment. That where whatever we have or don't have, we would be content in Christ. And in every way, help us to bring you glory with our time, our lives, and our money. In Jesus' name, amen.